see you on the show. <laughs> Welcome. It's Hi, Joe. Gone. How are you? How are you today? <laughs> so everybody, here's Gareth Dyke for you. A uh, long-term, should I say, acquaintance or friend. I think we consider each other friends. We've never met in person. Um, not that I remember. Um, but we have uh, very much engaged over various digital tools and devices around the topic of open access, preprints, um, scholarly publishing. Um, you've invited me to co-facilitate a webinar to Saudi Arabian medical researchers, which was quite interesting and a nice opportunity. Um, thanks again for that. And um, so yeah, here we are um, to talk about preprints today. So thanks for joining. Oh, cool. No, no. Thanks for inviting me. Preprints are everybody's favorite subject, of course. So, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Great to be here. Well, and yeah, that, that it should be. We're well, that webinar we did. That webinar we did was for the IVPN network, um, which is a big Gulf region network of pharmacists and medical researchers. Mm. So, yeah, it was great. Yeah. Talking about open science, open research. But yeah, brilliant. So um, starting off, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, um, how your career went from paleontology and now uh, being, a, how do you consider it, like a um, communications person um, previously or until recently for Adams? And maybe we can also spend some time about talking about Adams and their services and what they offer. And now for Research Square. Um, both of which are companies who are very much of service to the scholarly community. And yeah, but starting with yourself. So who are you? What are you doing here? And why? <laughs> also, I'm yeah, you. great. Yeah. And, um, oh, I got, I got, I, <laughs> I got involved in author services in around 2015, 2016, um, starting off as an editor, working on other people's papers, um, which I greatly enjoyed and got like a really good, I hope, good appreciation for the the process and the amount of work that people put into editing. Can I, can I put a break for a second? Can we start with paleontology? Because what I often ask people in my workshops is why did you become a researcher in the first place? And often enough, it's a, it's a deep passion they have for the mm. subject or it's a deep curiosity. And paleontology is like... A, um it's not a far far fetch for young boys you would think <laughs> everybody loves dinosaurs also girls so i went to university to study biology and i didn't really know that paleontology was even a thing like throughout my childhood i was interested in in insects mostly actually oh okay not a um, dinosaur person no i wasn't really interested in fossils when i was a kid um although i you know just well i mean i i used to read dinosaur books and and things like that i suppose but my big passion when i was a child was you know animals um especially insects i used to breed and keep like lots of different kinds of stick insects and moths and butterflies so that was my kind of hobby when i was a kid so i went to university to study biology or zoology and my father didn't want me to study zoology really he thought it would just mean that i would become a zookeeper you know he wanted me to study something more uh you know hardcore like chemistry or physics or mathematics or something like that so anyway I went to university to study biology and I didn't even know that paleontology was really a thing you could study at university um and so I kind of got into it um actually when I went to an open day at Bristol University and I discovered that you could study geology and biology in the same degree and at that point I kind of thought oh well you know that you know that that sounds cool and so I really got interested in geology when I was at university because I could study it like together with biology and then through that you know became more and more interested in in fossils but not so much in the fossils actually but in the way that they moved in the past and so mm -hmm. really my my subject my expertise my interest was in biomechanics of fossils and in particular like trying to understand how birds and dinosaurs how birds developed the ability to fly and birds evolved feathers and how they started to use feathers to to fly around so 
I did a lot of work and published a bunch of papers on feather evolution, dinosaurs with feathers, um, the early evolution of birds. I remember the... Archaeopteryx. Are yeah. <laughs> many, many others. Yeah, Archaeopteryx is the most famous from Germany, from Bavaria. Oh, yeah. From that region of Germany oh. or Bavaria. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's my story um, in a nutshell. But yeah, I mean, I like the 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 finding of the fossils part mm. of paleontology too. So I used to do a lot of field work and still do actually some field trips every so often, looking for fossils, collecting fossils, digging them up, you know? So it's still, you still have it in you? Yeah, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I- I say, once a scientist, always a scientist. That's also what I feel, even though I might not practice bi biology research anymore, but, you never lose the skill set and the curiosity and the enthusiasm for research. Right, right. And um, I think that that is a huge transferable skill that lots of people um, probably could take more advantage of. Um, when they finish PhDs or postdocs, people often end up leaving academia. The skills that you learn like as an academic could be, should be much more transferable to other like lines of work. And so I kind of discovered that by accident, like now that I'm doing content, content marketing, um, creating the kinds of things that we hope will help researchers with their problems, with their pain points, as business people like to say. So that's what I do now is um, um, training, content creation, content delivery. I mean, in the business world, it's content marketing, really helping mm -hmm. people um to learn about our products and services, but doing it in such a way that they're getting information, helpful information, uh, content from us that helps them to um, overcome problems. Mm -hmm. Selecting a journal, writing a paper, dealing with English language, writing and communication skills, like managing the publication process, dealing with peer review, all that great stuff. So open like, science. Sorry to interrupt for interrupting because at the age, age the, the the journal services that you have is, at ResearchGate, it, uh, it seems that even though you're a native speaker, or maybe especially um, because of that, um, you seem to have quite a lot of empathy for non-native English speakers, like in the way you, you market the services and the way you explain in your webinars how they can be of use. I spent a lot of time as an academic, as a researcher, working on papers and working with colleagues and friends who were not native speakers. I worked a lot in Kazakhstan. I worked a lot in Russia, for example, in particular. Um, and people would always send me their papers to correct. And I'd always do it, of course. Like, I remember working a lot on some papers that an old friend of mine, he died, but um, he was the head of paleontology at the Russian um, Paleontological Institute in Moscow. And I would always edit his papers and often we'd publish papers together. So yeah, like, and then after I started working for a company called Charlesworth, Charlesworth Author Services, I got the chance to travel to China, ended mm -hmm. up spending um, quite a lot of time in China, working with researchers, doing workshops. So people tell me that my English is quite easy to understand and, you know, have some experience writing and publishing. So can give tips and tricks and solutions mm. to problems and stuff like that. So yeah, I love it. It's great. Lots of fun. How did it come that you traveled more to the east of the planet? Like if we consider Europe and Great Britain as a center, which is also a little bit Eurocentric by its nature. Well, um, most of our business, most of our customers, most of the researchers that we work with are in uh, Japan and in China mm -hmm. um, depending upon the company that you work with the, you know more or less um, in Asia Southeast Asia that kind of that kind of region but I mean that's where most of the research is also being done these days I mean huge amounts of great research being done in China and um, you know because people are not native speakers and often need help to understand the publication process we find that you know there's often the same kinds of issues that many researchers will ask us so we've been able to develop like banks of 
questions, frequently asked questions and webinars and training and other products and services that help people with those specific things. Mm. So. And given the language barrier, um, especially in Asia, but also other world regions, um, do you consider, do you see that there's various bubbles like science communication bubbles, despite the Western and Anglophone research bubble, which is presumably the biggest? Do you really think that's the case? Is yeah. that in a Western context, it's often said as such? Yeah, definitely. My friends in China, for example, tell me that it's much less of a of a thing science communication mm -hmm. um, talking about your research presenting your research like outside of the publication cycle wow. um it's just done less i mean well we hope that it will be done more and more of course but it's just been less of a priority i think up until up until quite recently but isn't it also quite recent for us in europe and north america and relatively yeah. speaking of course like we've been growing into it for the past decade or so but before that even when i was a phd soon i don't think there was a lot of science communication awareness yeah we never bothered with it when i was working at universities or at least i never bothered with it i mean i had colleagues and friends who were really into being on tv and communicating their science and you know talking about dinosaurs and becoming famous and all that kind of thing but and we had people at our universities, and of course, this is still a very important and ever-growing, you know, part of UK university life. But you know, they contact us rather than the other way around, mm. if that if that makes sense. I mean, I was not really um, doing all that much science communication. I mean, I would publish papers and then move on to the next research project. You know, and then like in China, you get to know about or you learned about Adams, the company. Or was it a smooth transition from the other one? Or well, I mean, I, I had no idea that this kind of business even existed, like when I was working as an academic. And of course, like being a native speaker and hopefully not needing much help with writing and publishing my own work, because I love to write. And actually, that part of the publication process was the bit that I really enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I still really enjoy like the writing up of papers and dealing with editors and peer reviewers. And I've been an editor myself for almost 19 years now, like working with Taylor and Francis on a, another academic journal that's called Historical Biology. So um, I still kind of bounce around and do all these kinds of different things. But yeah, I, I was working as an editor. And then one day I got a call from the team at Charlesworth Author Services asking me like, would I be interested in doing some workshops for them and so I did that and I went to China and I did some workshops and you know this whole kind of new alternative area of work like opened up and, and through that work I learned about the other companies that do this kind of work Inago, Editage, Edance, mm -hmm. AJE which is part of the company that I work for now and there are many others working in different areas, different regions, some specialized in Korea, some specialized in China, Top Edit, the company that I also used to work for is a uh, Chinese company. Um, almost 100% of its customers are in China. So I learned a lot about Chinese researchers, the problems that they particularly face, as well as Chinese social media and how to, how to talk to people using the different platforms that people use in China. So not LinkedIn, <laughs> for example. Yeah, uh, I I heard about it, like it's massive with also not TikTok, but they have their own social media. Um yeah, yeah tick TikTok is a is the Western version of a of a Chinese um platform called Douyin. Mm -hmm. Again, I never my pronunciation will be terrible and people will be laughing at me when I say these words, but yeah. And in Russia they also have similar channels, but for Russians or in Russian made. Yeah. Um right. and do you see ways to intersect and um have these systems interoperate so that some of the knowledge and um expertise can uh spill over from one bubble to the other? 
Well, we try to do that. We do try to do that. I mean, we try to, for example, like when we create content at Research Square, we would use that content in a, in a variety of different platforms, on a variety of different platforms to try and reach people who are using different media. I mean, I don't think the problems that researchers face around the world vary all that much, depending mm. upon where you work. I mean, a lot of it has to do with English language, of course, but the kinds of issues that people ask us about, the kinds of questions that they have are universal. I mean, everybody struggles with finding a journal for their research papers. Everybody struggles with getting started on a research project. Mm -hmm. Big question that people always ask is how to how to come up with a good question for my research, like how to identify what we call a knowledge gap or, you know, that kind of thing. So the problems are universal. It's just that the ways that people consume the content that we create and the help that we try to provide them vary. Some people use Telegram, Instagram, mm -hmm. WeChat. TikTok, you name it. I mean, you you name it, like it's just, and so we have to kind of stretch ourselves as thin as possible and try to engage with these different platforms. And since the pandemic, when I started working um, for a top edit, this Chinese um, author services company at the beginning of 2020, like everything went online almost entirely. And I've still, even though everyone else is like bouncing around the world again and quite happy about it, like I'm actually preferring to stay like you know online and that became my kind of specific area of expertise I guess like webinars and online mm -hmm. training online engagement I mean I used to do and still do like a lot of face-to-face -face teaching and obviously being a academic working at universities you know got some teaching experience over the years but yeah I mean I kind of prefer webinars and I kind of feel that that we learned as an industry, or at least in our author services, helping people industry, coaching industry, basically, is that, you know, we don't need to do so much, you know, rushing around when we can provide quite a lot of engagement and the same kind of help in an online environment. Mm. So. Yeah, thanks for sharing these insights. Um, let's talk a little bit about Research Square and kind of work sure. there and then finally come to the topic of the day, which is preprints and okay. what they're good for and why they're so awesome. And what are they good for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we should call this session preprints. Pre what are they good for? <laughs> Many <Yeah>. things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but Research Square. So, yes. Um, what is it? And why should you be interested? Why should you care? <laughs> <Research>. <laughs> you find Re Gareth there. That's a good reason. Research Square Company, um, founded in 2004 by a man, a wonderful man called Shashi Mudanori. Um, it's got two parts to it now, Research Square Company. Part number one is the Research Square, the preprint server. Okay. And that's now, as we'll talk about in a minute. That's the biggest preprint server in the world in terms of number of submissions to it. I might be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what we tell people. I'm not <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest in the world. And that's largely because of the pandemic, or at least the acceleration in submissions mm -hmm. to Research Square, the preprint server, um, happened um, because of all the work that people were doing on COVID and related um, topics. So that's part one um research square the preprint server we call it the platform <laughs> within the business mm -hmm. and the second bit is aje the professional services um company aje um american journal experts now aje.com um and that's part of the company that provides editing translation services and other professional services like making posters uh, formatting references making tables all that kind of stuff so if you if you need help with a paper and you're working on a paper for submission to a journal then aje can help you with all of that kind of stuff so that's the that's the company yeah what i like about the aje services also that they have um products for every uh it's about like pocket size in the sense of um affordability so there is oh, really? editing 
there is hands-on editing and the automated editing is already pretty good like yeah 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 i forgot to mention yeah like a big part of aje is the digital services so ai editing artificial intelligence get your paper edited by a robot you know no you you upload your paper and then literally six minutes later the the website spits out an edited version with the track changes and stuff so yeah it's pretty cool really cool i like it because compared to the other kinds of services that you see in this space this particular tool actually helps you to understand why the changes were made which is really helpful for academics the other one May I just ask on that, on the editing algorithm, how yeah. does it compare to Grammarly? Because how does it compare? Is it like yeah. similar in its approach and how well can it read into research discipline specific terminology? I think that's cool. still the, yeah. the trade-off or where there's still a need for hands-on editing, obviously. Oh, yeah. Knowledge. Oh, yeah. No, definitely, definitely. I mean, people use this editing AI tool at different stages of the editing process. So some people might use it at the start, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing to do with a paper, get it edited with the AI tool, save yourself some time. Or it's also useful if you've done an editing job, like if you're working for a journal or in the production process, for example, you've got a document that you think is ready to go into production, you can run it, you can run the document through this tool just to make sure there are no silly mistakes, you know, no spelling mistakes, yeah. no inconsistencies between American and British English. So that it's useful at, at the two different ends of the editing process. How does it compare to Grammarly? Other editing tools are also available. Other AI <laughs> editing tools are also available. Other supermarkets are also available. Yeah. Um, Grammarly, of course, is the most famous, but that's a tool that you would use um, to check your general writing. So mm -hmm. you can use it when you have to write an email or, you know, a document. So it's very good at checking, you know, regular writing mm -hmm. and giving you suggestions for different phraseologies that you might use when you have to write an email. So I know lots of people, for example, who are not native English speakers that use that tool to check that their emails that they send to other people are not, you know, riddled with errors for example you know and I also, it, in also because i'm not a native speaker but mostly because i type so fast and then and then autocorrect makes silly sentences out of my writing and then grammar right. is an easy way to to spot and correct on the fly but yeah. yeah so so what i hear from you is that the lge algorithm is more research specific so it might have exactly the research yeah. better yeah, well, it was trained, the, the algorithm was trained on academic papers. So, you know, if you're a chemist and you upload a chemistry paper, then it's going to give you edits, suggestions, and, and, you know, changes that are very specific to your academic discipline. And so that's what makes it different mm. to, to the alternatives, right? Sure. Pe people like it too, because the comments that come back actually help researchers to understand um, why the tool has made a change. Rather than just making the change, you can actually see why the change was made. So the idea is that if you use it enough, you're gonna learn you know, and improve your own writing at the same time, which is great because everybody wants to get better. They don't just wanna you know, throw something into a machine and you know, get something back. They wanna actually learn like, mm. you know, you know, and get better and improve their writing too. It's also super, super affordable. One year subscription, just $106. I know, amazing, right? That's not bad. $100, $100. Use it as many times as you like over the course of a whole year, 365 days, good value. Go over to aje.com and check it out now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. Okay, let's talk about preprints. Okay. So what are most submissions that come into Research Square as in topics and discipline yeah. presentation? Uh, yeah, okay. So as you'll know yourself, Joe, being like an expert on preprints and open science, like most of the submissions that we get are STEM discipline specific. So science, technology, engineering, medicine. Um, still, unfortunately, 
or fortunately, depending on your perspective, very few researchers overall use preprint servers. I think the percentage is still about 10 to 12%. But it's double digits. That's not bad compared to just recently. But yeah. Well, but when you sit like, enormous. yeah, when you sit in our position and you know, like, the huge benefits to a researcher, to their career, to their visibility, to their impact, mm -hmm. to their citations, to the peer review process of uploading a preprint, like, like I can't now myself believe that that everybody just doesn't do it automatically but in my research career i never did it ever like i've not pre-printed anything i never did that it was never a thing i was never even encouraged to do that so i think we've got a lot of work to do and it's kind of our responsibility to educate and provide some kind of support and training so that researchers will understand why it's such a huge hugely beneficial thing that they could be doing um, but like we were talking before, we always get the same questions about preprints. We always get the same concerns from authors about preprints. Yeah, but to answer the question that you actually asked me, yeah, like most of our preprints are are in those STEM mm. disciplines with a strong think, bias towards medicine. Yeah, but I think also that the publication pressure is the highest in STEM. Right. And the disciplines might not have such an urge to, mm. have to publish the heck out of their research. Um, so let's define preprints for a second. So my definition is a manuscript that's deemed ready for submission to a journal right. um, to upload to a standardized scholarly repository, which, and that's the important part, you can also upload it to your website or to the institutional website. But the beauty with preprints and preprint repositories is that the discoverability will increase dramatically by the repositories assigning DOIs and also the open licenses so that scholarly um, literature search bots can detect them and based on the, okay, it's already getting technical, <laughs> based on the keywords and metadata that you add to the um, submission, um, it has quite a high chance of being discovered through a literature search in whichever scholarly literature database you, and there's more than the two usual suspects, um, but we may come to that later on. Okay, sticking to preprint. So that's basically how I normally describe a preprint. And it can also stay there. You may still submit to a journal, um, at this point, and then a question for me to you would be, how do a journal editor see that? And wouldn't it seem redundant from their point of view? But of course, most journals have now embraced the idea of preprint and they might also get better quality submissions as a benefit. Okay, so first of all, do you have anything to add to that kind of rambling definition that I just post or maybe shorter more concise and more accurate one uh, no i mean i think it's very that's a good, i know that's a good that's a good description for for researchers and of course like um it that should be the description of what a preprint is because there are sites of course where you can put anything like at any stage you can upload anything that you've done you mm -hmm. can upload just a title or just an abstract and I'm thinking of one platform in particular, but I wouldn't encourage that um, as a supervisor, as like a, you know, somebody mentoring young researchers to develop their careers. I'd rather say to people, if you're going to preprint, I think you should preprint your work. You should put your work on a preprint server, but let's put up onto the preprint server what we're ready to submit to a journal, like, because otherwise putting up stuff too early could be detrimental to your career, your reputation, you know? So yeah, like I think that we should be encouraging people to preprint their work, but in a state, in a draft, in a version that's final, you know, in their, in their mind. And that's why we have actually most of our submissions to the Research Square preprint server come in through a platform called InReview which is a Springer Nature um, 
review platform, peer review platform. So you might go, for example, with your draft, with your final draft of your paper to, let's say, scientific reports, just to pick one Springer mm -hmm. Nature journal at random. Other journals are available. Other publishers are available. And in fact, quite a lot of other publishers are also in the in-review system, other journals. So not just Springer Nature journals. And we should say as well at this point, for full disclosure, I didn't mention this earlier, but Research Square Company is almost entirely part of Springer Nature. It's a at the moment like a almost completely um, owned um, part of the Springer Nature group. So that's why I'm mentioning Springer Nature in this context. Mm -hmm. So I'm going, I'm I'm going to submit to scientific reports. I'm in the scientific reports submission system. And as I make my submission to scientific reports with, of course, a draft of my paper that I feel is ready to be submitted to scientific reports, I am at that point when I submit the paper to the journal, I'm also able to preprint the paper um, through the in review platform. So my submission goes to the editor. The editor gets a little email saying, Gareth just sent a paper into your submission system. And simultaneously, it goes onto the editorial flow at the Research Square preprint server. And that's great. And I encourage people to check it out because that's great because now your paper's getting reviewed. Like it's gone to Joe and, you know, Joe and Joe for like peer review, right? But at the same time, other colleagues in your research area can see it on the preprint platform. They can comment on it on the preprint platform. Those comments that they might make could be used by the editor at Scientific Reports to help them make a decision about what to do with the paper that's in review. And that's why the platform's called In Review, because you as an author, you can see what's going on. You can see the comments being added to the preprint. Obviously, you can respond if you want, you know, they can help you to enhance the paper if you want. I mean, somebody might make a comment saying, well, why didn't you do the analysis in this way as well as the way that you did? And you might think, well, that's a great suggestion. I'm going to do that. And that actually makes the final published version of the paper better. Mm -hmm. more information, more outcome for other researchers. So it's very transparent. Um, but, you know, people have some difficulties, especially journal editors sometimes, like, you know, accepting it. I mean, it's still considered to be quite a new thing, even yeah, though it's, it's 10 years old. It looks like, a, it looks a little bit redundant, but what you just um, explained as a scenario that also editors and reviewers can use the in review community review commenting approach to inform their own decision making and their own reviews um to yeah to um to make their own decisions on accepting or rejecting and recommending to the authors of a particular manuscript but then um the other scenario that you just um uh, mentioned as in submitting a, an improved version of the manuscript after the public commenting to the editorial board. Is that an option in your system that yeah, submit yeah, yeah, yeah. a journal and then I don't know what time scale they apply for the review process, but then you can still let them, hey, now we have a few comments and we actually made a few more experiments. Can we just- Yeah, I mean, <laughs> That's the way it works. I mean, you can, I put a preprint up mm -hmm. and that preprint stays there, right? Like that, that first submission that I make to the preprint platform is going to stay on the platform mm -hmm. so people can see the process. So I might upload a second version or a third version, you know, and, you know, depending upon the editorial control, which is very light touch at Research Square. I mean, we just check papers to make sure that they're not, you know, completely oh, out there you know yeah. before we preprint them but then what that means is that you'd end up with or you could end up with a whole series of versions of my paper culminating in that final published version that comes out in scientific reports the example that we're using 
um, for this discussion. And so that's great. Of course, every paper that gets published in a journal, in a peer-reviewed journal, has probably gone through multiple drafts. I mean, some of my papers that got published <laughs> had gone through like 20, 30 drafts, you know, before they finally got published. But we just chucked away all the previous versions. You know, we just deleted the files or, you know, emptied the paper recycling, you know. <laughs> this is good for open science because this way, you know, everybody can see the evolution of the paper to the final published version. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good also for the record, for like, you know, imagine if we had that kind of information for Einstein's papers or, you know, pick your famous scientist. Like it's really valuable for us to have, to understand the evolution of the thought processes and also, you know, where the ideas came from. I mean, I'm just thinking aloud, but, you know, all kinds of other avenues for research could be opened up by this process, you know, because we can see things that didn't work. We can see like ideas that didn't go anywhere that didn't end up in the final published version. So if you're looking for the relationship between open research and preprinting and preprint servers, I mean, there you have it. Like what could be more open than than that? Yeah, an Seems open discourse with colleagues from anywhere in the world. And then, so what is the added value that then the journal published version adds, the version of record in a journal? Is the layouting, maybe additional comments by their reviewing board of editors and the peer reviewers they select? Yeah, I mean, that's the final accepted, fully peer reviewed version of record, as you've just mentioned. So that's what should be cited in subsequent studies. But of course, the other great thing about preprints is that, as you mentioned earlier as well, like they get assigned DOI numbers, document object identifier numbers. They get assigned the fantastic Creative Commons license um, identifications also. So I can cite them and that makes my subsequent work also much richer because I can say, well, even though Joe published this paper saying this, if you look at her preprint, like from the year before, you can see that she didn't think that when she first wrote the paper. And that's, I think that's hugely important, hugely valuable, mm. um, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it opens up a level of transparency, obviously, um, for the yeah. scientific discourse, trust building. There's well, there's the other side to that coin as well, unfortunately, or fortunately, and we saw this in the pandemic with all of the coronavirus preprints, like there has to be this clear understanding, of course, that we're doing this, we're preprinting, we're, we're advocates of open research and open science, but the final peer reviewed version is the version that we should be promoting, talking about, basing our decisions on, basing other research upon and so for example during the during the pandemic lots of preprints that appeared on the research square platform ended up not and ended up not in the peer-reviewed literature but were still talked about a lot especially in the media and on twitter and whatnot um, because they were focused on aspects of the coronavirus so that's another piece of education and training and awareness that we have to work on you know, when I'm a journalist working for, you know, news magazine X and I see stuff coming out on a preprint server, I need to be aware that that stuff that's coming out on the preprint server is different and potentially different in reliability and quality, potentially, yeah. to the final peer review version of the article. Hi. I agree and disagree to some extent, just um, mentioning or adding that we should treat any piece of information with caution because we never know, depending on how closed or open the review process is and how rigorous being conducted, which in closed and often in journal settings, we have no insights to. I think, and I assume, and I think that's also measurable to an extent, that most peer reviewers um, commit to a rigorous review and to conduct it in the most possible um, fair and transparent and um, 
informative manner. And yet there has also been um, literature shared on the biases in peer review, which are less thereof if the peer review process is open and also on a preprint level. So there's, as you say, I think to, to whatever aspect um, we talk about, there's pros and cons. And I, I just personally think we need to address a level of caution to either approach and then eventually can make an informed decision making based on the information that we gather and by comparing different systems and yeah to a feasible extent obviously yeah i mean that's 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 one of the reasons why open research and preprinting is a good thing because everything becomes much more transparent right of course because in normal traditional journal publishing you just have the final published version you've got no idea like what kind of process if any that article really went through you know on the road to publication mm. i mean i know from my work as an editor that massive differences between the kinds of peer review that you might get for different papers depending upon the reviewer depending on their level of interest and everybody working as an academic um and maybe paleontology is one area where people do get very 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 angry and upset with each other if they disagree about something so <laughs> i've got some horror stories from peer review um maybe not for this discussion but like you know people get really angry this is the worst paper i've ever seen this person's a complete idiot like you know this paper should never be published you know like and and you know i don't know how you're supposed to Oh. maintain your um your composure and you know confidence in the face of some of the stuff that happens especially to you know younger researchers through the peer review process which reminds us that even researchers are still human beings with all the good and all the bad that comes with it right right exactly <laughs> exactly so i mean that's actually in my opinion like if you ask me like what's the biggest thing that young researchers should receive training and support in during their PhDs or, you know, early stages of their research careers. I think peer review, managing yourself as a peer reviewer, managing the peer review process. My experience, this was never taught to us as PhD mm. students in the UK, at least. And I've encountered a lot like around the world in different different countries um, that, you know, people are not trained to do it. I mean, yeah. Uh, they might get some training in academic writing or you know article construction but managing peer review no you're just expected at some point in your career to start doing it like after you've published a few papers maybe or you start to appear on some of those databases that editors use to find peer reviewers you start mm -hmm. getting you know invitations to peer review and you know <laughs> yeah. what do you do we just concluding, well, it's true what you say, like most people never um, undergo a training and peer review and it, it's so important to have that because there's so many aspects to consider. And one major aspect is also the level of accountability and friendliness in the way the review is being communicated or conducted. Um, we just concluded uh, trying the trainer and peer review um, program with eLife and TCC Africa, Africa Archive, um, Ada Africa, and pre review. And pre review is also a company or, um, which specializes on preprint based peer review. Um, and they have compiled an extensive list of training materials for the peer review process. And also, all the major publishers um, have, or like the well, for sure, the big five publishers, um, one of which is Springer Nature, um, but it was, and also PLOS has, they all have on their websites training materials and guidelines for peer review. So it is possible to um, acquire the necessary knowledge and best practices and how to approach. Not saying that that's in the awareness of most researchers who actually do the peer review. So. Um, people like us, you and I can also further sensitize on the opportunities and share the best practices that we deem most relevant. Stay tuned because...
the fantastic peer review week is coming up oh, the yeah. week of the 19th of September yeah nobody really knows about it outside of the industry the industry I mean at least um, researchers that I talk to have never heard of peer review week I'd never heard of peer review week when I was a researcher but we are going to be releasing like letting out of the cage like quite a lot of content and other helpful stuff during peer review week and something that I do plan to do um, I keep talking about this but I never actually get around to it is to put together all of the resources that there are available from different companies different publishers different trainers like access to perspectives, for example, in one place for people to be able to find it all um, on I'm one. Serious, website. you know that we like. I think like for that aforementioned training program, we did just that. So I can give you a list if you want. There you go, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I don't need to do that anymore. Then, if you could just give it to me, I could just take your name off it and. Sure. Pretend that it's mine. Go nuts with it. <laughs> okay, let me first preprint the whole thing with our yeah, no, you have to you do that. See, there you go. <laughs> Preprinting is great because it protects no your research. Pooping. Absolutely. <laughs> like that's the number one question that researchers ask. What if I pre if I preprint yeah. if I preprint my paper on your platform, won't somebody steal it and publish the work in a journal? Number one question, big concern about preprints. Of course they could, but yeah, you've got your preprint, you've got proof of um, priority, you've got that DOI number, um, you know? Um, I mean, it could um, happen with a published paper too, of course, you know, and it does happen with published papers all the time, you know? Joe publishes something in German, for example. Hardly I, ever. I translate it and publish it again in English. And that has happened, not between you and I, but this actually happens that somebody just translates something yeah. from another oh, language yeah. and publishes on the name without citing the original source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's when people feel too comfortable with the language barriers, which we yeah. are also trying to dismantle. Yeah, that's all part of what we're trying to do. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to get too bogged down in the commercial stuff because that's not why we do what we do. Like, I do what I do because I want to help researchers um, with their problems. So, and hopefully, um, I think that this is becoming more and more of a thing um, in scholarly publishing or in, um, you know, author services or whatever you want to call it. I mean, and that's great. I mean, I think it's really great. And okay. so... Yeah, I think really that's that it's great. Like I've had several guests on this podcast now and more to come who represent um, researcher services, author yeah. services. Right. Because researchers are expected and grow into developing a skill set of professional expertise that's humanly impossible to carry, really. And why not diverge and delegate some of that to professionals who can actually make our lives as researchers easier and much better in what they don't have specialized and know the whole um, portfolio absolutely. of options that are available. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I wish I'd known about all of this resource, all of these different organizations and companies when I was working as an academic, because it would have helped a lot like i mean for me journal selection would have been great like you know i just picked journals based on where i was seeing other colleagues and other researchers publish in their work mm -hmm. you know um i knew about impact factors of course everybody who's an academic like knows and the that's impact. like <laughs> that's like why do most if not all researchers you know later and for some time at least four for the impact factors, like the biggest misconception ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, but yeah, has really changed the academic scholarly system. That's a whole different podcast. We could have another podcast. It's totally it's where we another slag off impact sure. factors. <laughs> um, and we can also talk about the benefits that factors and impact factors have because they make things measurable. But um, the originator of the impact factor wrote a paper. Um, announcing it or kind of describing it, which was then taken further into a product, but um, or product development. 
Um, but he explicitly in his paper, Garfield, what was his name? We've seen Garfield. Um, he explicitly um, um, made clear that there's too many um, unknowns that lead to whatever then is considered an impact factor and too many variables across disciplines that it's, it doesn't say anything really. It's a number with no meaning, but um, but yeah, we use it as a scholarly community. And yeah, let's totally talk about it, why it's become so important and such a decision maker for careers um, and also for the success of journals. Um, for the rankings of universities, like where it has its influence. And also let's talk about the benefits because there's a lot, like I be all up for bashing the impact factor and I do that wherever I can, but there's also reasoning and a need for a level of comparison to, yeah, for quality assurance and what alternatives do we have if not the impact factor. And maybe the impact factor has some value to it if we look at it from a balanced viewpoint. I don't know. Oh, let's find out. Yeah, like we'll have to we'll have to let let's 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 have another um another chat about that. Because I've got lots of stories about about impact factor. And I know, and I know like you had our friendly disputes around especially that topic. So let's totally take this for another conversation yeah. at this show. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to join you on your podcast today. Thank it's you been for great. being here and for sharing all your insights, all your um, experiences, and also for your sales pitches here and there. <laughs> very well, much needed. <laughs> check out Research you. Square. Thank it's not. I mean, re researchsquare.com. I didn't mention that yet. But well, check it out, everybody. Research. All the you find all the links in the show notes and uh, so if yeah. you the blog post. So, yeah, welcome back here to the show to meet Gareth again. And thanks again, Gareth, for joining. Mm -hmm.